this is a war game it is used to develop military strategy the tanks roll the weapons fire the soldiers march one side wins one side loses and the generals get to watch but how do you develop nuclear strategy how did today's strategies evolve This is a computer simulation of an atom bomb used in war. It is the latest tool of military planners. They must use it to test new strategies fit for the nuclear age. The challenge now is to develop a strategy to prevent war, not win it. Nuclear weapons serve only one purpose. It's an important purpose, but it's a single purpose. And that's to prevent the use of nuclear weapons against us or our friends. You can't use a gun against mosquito. Or you can't use something that will kill you against your enemy. The weapons are there, they exist. We can't will them out of uh, existence. But we can hope to manage their consequences so that uh, those consequences are peace and security and not war. The public can and must understand the, uh, those technical details about nuclear weapons and nuclear, the nuclear arms race that are relevant to set policy. You don't have to know the size of the screw that you put into the nuclear warhead, but you have to know something about what it does. You have to know something about the effects of a nuclear war. You have to know something about the impossibility of trying to control such a war. Nuclear strategy had its origin in World War II, when both sides used strategic bombing, the deliberate destruction of industrial and population centers from the air. Strategic bombing was meant to break the will of an opponent through terror and mass destruction. This was total war. Everything and everyone could become a target. Society was pitted against society. As the war raged on, a race began to make a new weapon a weapon ideally suited to the new strategy. I worked the Manhattan Project in wartime, of course, and I worked essentially out of fear. We believed the Germans were more organized, more able, and certainly more militarily directed than we, and we feared that the atomic bomb would appear first in the hands of the Third Reich, in the hands of Hitler. The Manhattan Project, the American atomic bomb program, succeeded where the Germans failed. Yet it was not until two months after the German surrender that the scientists were ready. A test was set for July 16, 1945. This device would release the force that holds together atoms. The test was called Trinity. It appeared as though the sun had risen. What I didn't, hadn't thought of was it was not only bright, but was also giving out radiant energy, heat. And my face warmed up as though I were facing the morning sun in the cold desert morning, suddenly out of darkness, then in a minute it went away again. So it was an artificial sunrise, so to speak. Word of Trinity's success reached President Truman at Potsdam. The Allies were meeting to decide the new political shape of the world. When Truman casually informed Stalin that the U.S. had a new weapon of unusual destructive force, Stalin replied that he hoped Truman would make good use of it against the Japanese. From Potsdam, the Western Allies issued a demand for Japan's unconditional surrender. A vast armada was dropping hundreds of tons of bombs on Japan, while a million men were being assembled for what was expected to be a bloody invasion. The Japanese still refused to surrender. The entire stockpile of bombs was sent to the Pacific, two bombs. Japan would be delivered a sudden shock in hopes of forcing its early surrender. On August 6th, the new weapon and the new strategy were brought together. Total war was fully realized. When I touched in with my sight, I could clearly see the city of Hiroshima. And I felt the bump of the airplane. I was greatly relieved because I knew the unit had gone from the airplane that we had successfully delivered. It meant so much to the Army Air Forces, American science and industry. Within a few millionths of a second, a few pounds of uranium were converted to energy 
creating a fireball of 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. By the end of that day, almost 50,000 people were dead. Another 100,000 were injured, a third of whom would die in the next weeks. Here is one child who did not die. Here is the face of just one who witnessed that morning, the sun that rose from the west. It is an atomic bomb, President Truman says. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. If they do not now accept our terms, Mr. Truman said, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. On August 9th, another plane took off. A second plane, a second bomb, and a second city. Nagasaki. Ladies and gentlemen, the president has just announced full acceptance of the unconditional surrender terms by the Japanese. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. While the horn toots, the confetti flies, jubilation and excitement and joy fills the air. To the cheering crowds, the atom bomb was seen as an instrument of peace. Having found the atomic bomb, we have used it. It is an awful responsibility which has come to us. We thank God that it has come to us instead of to our enemies. And we pray that he may guide us to use it in his ways and for his purposes. The Americans and Russians celebrated their victory. But beneath the surface camaraderie, there was already great mistrust. Professor Michael Knox. The U.S.-Soviet relationship was always a marriage of convenience that only began when there was a common enemy, namely Nazi Germany. And once the common objective was met, all of the old differences came to the fore. There was a lot of discussion whether war with the Soviet Union would be the next phase of the Second World War. So it wasn't a matter of a sort of sharp break. Instead, it was a matter of the resurgence of old antagonisms, ideological differences, political rivalries, different economic systems, and two competing military powers. Celebrating the Allied victory under banners honoring Stalin and Roosevelt, the troops enjoyed a very short honeymoon. But the American GIs would have to be brought home soon, leaving their Soviet counterparts poised across an exhausted Europe, ready, so the Americans feared, to take it over. By October of 1945, U.S. military planners had completed this top secret study. It was a contingency plan for defeating the Soviet Union with 20 atomic bombs. But at the time, the U.S. didn't have any more bombs. In actual practice, no coherent nuclear strategy had yet been developed. The basic American approach was just to try and compete with the Russians in Eastern Europe, try not to let them take control of Eastern Europe, which in fact failed, and at the same time accumulate nuclear weapons but never really quite know when and under what conditions we would use them short of a direct attack on the United States. Out of Bikini comes the amazing camera record of history's greatest military experiment. Joint Task Force One opens the final... A year after the war, tests were begun in the Pacific to learn more about what the bomb could do. Former Ensign Bill Finnegan. We heard the countdown, 10, 9, 8, etc and the bomb went off. I think the most significant memory I have of that blast was the light and its ever-increasing intensity. It seemed uh, that it was, it was not going to stop, and I'm sure that uh, others like me thought maybe this time there'd been a mistake and this was the end of the world. The test dramatized the U.S. monopoly on atomic weapons and strengthened the impression of unequaled American power. The top secret fact was that at the time, the U.S. had only one or two usable bombs. The U.S. has the atom bomb. The Russians do not have it, at least until 1949. And yet, that's a time when the Soviets, under Stalin's leadership, do very well in terms of consolidating their control over Eastern Europe and making major territorial gains. So here, this tells you something about the limited use of nuclear weapons. The U.S. had nuclear weapons and was unable to use them in any way to prevent the Soviets 
from uh, acquiring a, a lot of additional territory. The Soviets, while publicly downplaying the bomb's importance, were straining to get it themselves. In Moscow, physicist Sergei Kapitza. All the necessary scientific background exists in our country. And it was a question of mobilizing our, I should say, technological resources, not only scientific ones, to solve the problem. And the main secret was now well known that the atom bomb can be built. Igor Kurchatov headed the Soviet atom bomb project. He had constructed Europe's first atom smasher in 1939. In 1943, when the Soviets began their atomic program, Kurchatov was put in charge. His success came far sooner than Americans expected, just four years after Trinity. Professor Stephen Meyer. The detonation of the Soviet atomic bomb in 1949 didn't affect Soviet strategy at all. It gave them a weapon that they felt now they could at least match U.S. firepower, but it wasn't until Stalin died in 1953 that the Soviet military was allowed to think about atomic weapons in a revolutionary way. Before then, all the Soviet military writings, at which the, the military officers were talking about strategy, uh, continued to talk about the basic operating factors that developed out of World War II, the use of tank forces, the use of reserves, and excluded the atomic bomb. Although neither side had a fully formed nuclear strategy, they pressed ahead with developing a super weapon, the hydrogen bomb. The Lugalab Atoll was the site of the first American test in 1952. The device would yield a force a thousand times greater than Hiroshima. A piece of the stars brought down to Earth. With the H-bomb, even a miss of many miles would destroy a city. By 1954, both sides had it. The American nuclear weapons monopoly was broken. But the U.S. still had an important advantage, a monopoly on the means of delivering nuclear weapons. From forward bases near Soviet borders, long-range American bombers could reach almost any Soviet target. This technical and logistic superiority would make possible a new American strategy. By the early 50s, U.S.-Soviet relations had deteriorated dramatically. The coup in Czechoslovakia, the Berlin blockade, Korea and other conflicts had developed into the Cold War. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, alarmed by what he saw as Soviet advances around the world, announced the first formal nuclear strategy in early 1954. One of the lessons that some of the Eisenhower administration officials learned from the Korean War was why fight limited wars? Why sort of fight the communists on their own terms? Why don't we use our advantages, our assets? And they felt, and Dulles in particular felt, that our principal asset was still a major superiority in nuclear weapons. And therefore, Dulles articulated the first sort of formal, declared American nuclear strategy, which was if the Soviets or their communist allies uh, performed aggressively, even in remote parts of the world, we might in fact use nuclear weapons to attack the Soviet Union. And this became known as the doctrine of massive retaliation. This new jet bomber, the B-52, would help carry out the new strategy. Based in the United States, it could reach targets deep in the Soviet Union. Shorter range bombers continued to be based in the NATO countries of Europe. By 1956, massive retaliation meant nearly 2,000 bombers carrying as many as 7,000 bombs. Testing of new weapons was begun in the Nevada desert. How ordinary homes and other structures might be affected by blast, heat, and radiation was carefully studied. Weapons technicians worked out precise calculations to determine how much damage could be expected from different kinds of bombs. Since American strategy relied on technical superiority, tests were also held to see how nuclear weapons might be used on the battlefield and how combat troops would react. This testing helped develop a wide range of nuclear weapons, from cannon shells to lightweight H-bombs. 
In the mid-50s, such battlefield tactical nuclear weapons began to be deployed with the NATO forces in Europe. The Soviets had their own priorities. In Moscow in 1955, they unveiled their first intercontinental bomber, the Bison. Now they too could deliver nuclear weapons long distances. They flew a single test squadron over the Moscow parade again and again. Shocked Western observers thought they were counting many formations. This constant movement of bombers overhead was the effort to try to convince the West that the Soviets were a major strategic power, at least equal if not better than the United States, and that there was nothing to be gained by an attack. Um, this strategy appears many times in the future in, in, Soviet, uh, in, in, uh, in Soviet planning as well. It appears with missiles, it appears with air defense systems where they deploy phony systems that look real and so that the West believes there's actually more than, than there is there. The deception worked. U.S. intelligence estimated the Soviets were building thousands of new bombers. For the first time, Americans feared a Soviet surprise attack. On October 4, 1957, the Soviets gave America yet another shock, Sputnik. If they could send a beeping metal ball circling the Earth, they could also deliver an atomic bomb to Washington or New York. U.S. intelligence began to focus on a new potential Soviet threat, missiles. Sputnik is important because it gave Khrushchev, who was the Soviet leader at the time, the, the political power to uh, cancel the bomber programs that were in progress and shift the entire structure of Soviet military forces and military strategy towards the concept of missile nuclear warfare, marrying nuclear warheads with nuclear missiles. And that became the basis of Soviet military thinking throughout the 60s and the 70s. In response to Sputnik, the U.S. speeded up its own missile program to close what it saw as a missile gap. By the late 50s, it was able to begin basing these intermediate range missiles in Italy and Turkey, encircling the Soviet Union. Sputnik also forced a reevaluation of massive retaliation. What Sputnik did in terms of strategy was to denigrate the notion that massive retaliation was any longer credible. Because it showed, Sputnik showed that the Soviets had nuclear weapons, that the Soviets could use nuclear weapons on ballistic missiles to reach the United States territory in a very short amount of time. And therefore, it really wasn't believable that we would use nuclear weapons on Soviet territory if, for example, there was a small incursion in Southeast Asia. A massive retaliation disappeared as a realistic strategy at the time at which the Soviets developed a credible nuclear capability of their own. We therefore went to the doctrine of flexible response which says, in effect, that we will respond in a fashion which is commensurate with the aggression. In other words, we'd meet conventional attack with conventional attack. If we went on to a limited tactical nuclear war, then we would respond with tactical nuclear weapons. And in case of a strategic exchange, we'd respond that way. We proposed flexible response with a very high threshold, meaning that uh, uh, w we could hardly conceive of circumstances in which NATO could benefit by initiating the use of nuclear weapons. The new strategy was suddenly put to the test. In October 1962, aerial reconnaissance photographs revealed that the Soviets were secretly building missile bases in Cuba. The president called an emergency meeting of his top advisors. With missiles at its doorstep, the U.S. was threatened by nuclear weapons for the first time. On October 23rd, President Kennedy went on television. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Many people rushed to stock up on food and supplies as the two nations seemed to edge toward war. I can say without any qualification whatsoever that at no time during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, did we contemplate the, uh, the, initi the initiation of the use of nuclear weapons? Absolutely none. However, some of the alternatives to, that we did consider carried with them the risk that uh, there would be accidental or unintentional or unauthorized. 
proposed launch of nuclear weapons from Cuban soil by Cuban and or Soviet forces. The evidence suggests that the Cuban Missile Crisis was prompted by Khrushchev's effort to try and balance off U.S. strategic forces. Soviet intercontinental ballistic missile programs had fallen behind for, because of technical difficulties. And meanwhile, the U.S. ballistic missile program was about to take off with the deployment of a thousand Minutemen. And Kru it, the evidence is that Khrushchev then decided that one way to take up the gap in the short term was to deploy the, the medium-range ballistic missiles, which the Soviets already had, in Cuba to match the U.S. intercontinental force. Following a quarantine of Cuba and intensive negotiations, the Soviets removed their missiles. For the U.S., it was a vindication of flexible response. It's frequently said we prevailed because of uh, our nuclear superiority. That is not the case. Uh, the lesson is exactly the reverse. We prevailed because we had uh, conventional superiority in the area. After the crisis was over, a Soviet uh, diplomat is reported to have said, you'll never do this again. Uh, and many people take that to mean, well, now they've decided to do something new. In fact, what the Cuban Missile Crisis did was confirm uh, the view of many of the Soviet military authorities that they had it right the first time, that the Soviet military power should be based at home, based on the long-range intercontinental missiles, and that's where the program should concentrate. And the idea of deploying forces overseas uh, was a mistake. So it really reinforced those that were arguing against the Khrushchev move originally. Uh, and what you see developing after the Cuban Missile Crisis are a whole series of ICBM programs that had already been planned before the crisis and were put into operation. The Cuban Missile Crisis brought an increased public awareness of the dangers posed by nuclear weapons. Concern over radioactive fallout developed into worldwide opposition to nuclear testing. The public began questioning nuclear strategy that previously had been shrouded in secrecy and left to experts. With both sides frightened by the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Partial Test Ban Treaty was signed in 1963. The treaty restricted only above-ground testing. Its real significance, however, was in initiating the use of negotiations as an instrument of nuclear strategy. For the first time, we've been able to reach an agreement which can limit the dangers of this age. The treaty led to other agreements, such as a hotline between the two countries that would provide a communication link in times of emergency. Such confidence-building measures helped to create a new strategic understanding. By the mid-60s, the Soviets finally began deploying the intercontinental ballistic missiles the U.S. had expected almost a decade earlier. Both sides could now destroy the other from their own territory. Paul Warnke. Then it became apparent that since we no longer were alone in possession of the ability to destroy another country, that we had to rely on deterrence. Deterrence was a strategy born of necessity. Even if one of the superpowers were attacked first, some of its nuclear forces would survive. Those surviving forces would still be enough to destroy the country that attacked. Launching an attack would only bring the attacker's own destruction, so each side would be deterred from ever doing so. This strategic dilemma came to be called mutual assured destruction. An extensive U.S. buildup strengthened the deterrent effect of mutual assured destruction. Three systems were employed. The B-52, to avoid being caught on the ground if attacked, many B-52s were kept on constant alert. The fleet of 600 intercontinental bombers was completely modernized. The Polaris, a new kind of submarine that carried missiles. The missiles could be launched from underwater and the submarine could carry as many as 16 of them. By hiding in the ocean and moving constantly, the Polaris could survive an attack and retaliate. The Minuteman, a new land-based intercontinental ballistic missile. It was made more survivable by burying it underground in concrete-hardened silos. Only a direct hit could destroy it. One thousand were deployed throughout the Midwest. Together, the three systems came to be known as the Triad. The Soviets, however, took another path. Professor Meyer. They had uh, serious technical problems with their bomber programs all along, so that option was put aside. 
uh, missiles were deemed to be superior. Uh, they had technical problems with their missiles to the extent that the idea of a large submarine based force was not practical at the time. Their most reliable force, and it was not very reliable, but it was their most reliable force, uh, were the ICBMs, which were land based that they could control, that they could maintain uh, in real time in order to keep them operating. The Soviet deterrent relied mainly on their more numerous land based ICBMs. Eventually 1,400 strong and heavily protected, enough could survive an attack to deliver a devastating reply. Mutual assured destruction isn't a theory, it's a fact. It's a fact of life or a fact of death. The fact is that if one side attacks the other with nuclear weapons, both sides will be destroyed. And you can't get away from that. The political leadership and the Soviet military leadership recognize it as a state of being. Given current technology, nuclear weapons technology and missiles, and given the nature of the social structures of the countries, the cities, the urban development, there was no way for either side to get out from underneath the problem of assured destruction. It was a de facto state of being. and It, it wasn't desirable and it wasn't planned, but it existed. In 1972, the two sides reached an agreement that helped stabilize the relationship inherent in assured destruction. This was the culmination of the strategic arms limitation talks, known as SALT. It was a calculated attempt to use negotiation as an instrument of strategy. In the last half of the 1960s, you see the Russians building and the United States level. Uh, this, I think, more than anything else, was a stimulus for the U.S. to be interested in arms control negotiations. They were building, we weren't. We figured, why can't we negotiate to stop them from continuing to build? Arms control in Soviet strategy plays the same role as it does in American strategy. It's an effort to constrain the forces of the other side which one finds particularly threatening uh, and which for which one doesn't have a good countermeasure. Second, it's a good way to uh, try to make the arms race predictable and manageable and send it in directions that seem not to increase the insecurity of one's own country. So it is a fundamental part of security policy. SALT limited the number of weapons each side could have and established procedures for verifying them. Arms control is really a part of nuclear strategy. We want to build and negotiate. We want to have so-called stabilized forces. SALT is a means by which we begin to clarify our own definitions. What weapons are stabilizing, what weapons are destabilizing, what weapons are useful to have, what weapons are dangerous to have. It's important that, that uh, the U.S. introduce into its inventories weapons which stabilize rather than destabilize the relationship between the powers. If we were to introduce into our inventories weapons that appeared to the Soviets to be threatening uh, a first strike against their forces with the possibility that that first strike uh, would uh, so destroy their nuclear forces as to leave them without an ability to, to respond to us to our strike, that would be very dangerous and it would lead them to possibly try to preempt our strike under certain circumstances. And that's what I mean by destabilizing. With SALT, Brezhnev and Nixon acknowledged the balance of terror that is at the heart of mutual assured destruction. They attempted to make that balance less precarious. But at the same time, weapons technology they had left out of the agreement threatened to change the new strategic equilibrium. 